Right, this video is going to be all about packing and shipping pottery. I wanted to get this done before Christmas because I know a lot of people will be packing things to go internationally, possibly for the first time. Um, and there's always a kind of rush before Christmas, plus parcels are mishandled more this time of year because they take on temporary stuff. Uh, apologies for my voice, my toddler has tonsillitis and my throat's a little bit sore, but hopefully nothing as bad as he's got. Um, I'll re-record this if my voice doesn't hold, but hopefully it will. So, packing pottery. I pack a lot of pots to go internationally, and generally speaking, they survive. So I want to talk through, there's a full blog post that will go into, as always, a bit more detail, and if you prefer reading, then I'd recommend that. But I will talk through the logic of how I pack things and how I pick the packaging materials that I use. Um, and show you a couple of demo packing. Um, I'll pack a couple of orders. <clears throat> so to start with, the point of the packaging when you're packaging pottery is to get the piece there intact. That's the, the main thing. That's how you assess whether or not it works. But there are a bunch of other factors that help you determine whether a single packing choice is the right one. So protection is the main thing. It has to protect the work and it's no good if it doesn't. But there are other factors that you might want to consider, such as the cost, because someone has to pay for it. So either you have to charge more um, or you have to make less money if it's a more expensive packing material. There's the sustainability of it. You can get a single use plastic packaging material. You can get recycled single use plastic. So the bubble wrap can't necessarily be further recycled, but it can be used. Um, it's using 30 to 50% recycled material. You can get paper ones, which can be easily recycled, but there's a higher energy cost of producing them and so on and so forth. So environmental considerations are a thing. There's the appearance of the packaging, what sort of uh, experience you want your customer to have when they get it out of the box. Um, and different packaging options will lead into that with, with higher and lower qualities of kind of unboxing experience there's the bulkiness because some packaging materials need more of them to uh, adequately protect which means you need a bigger box um, there's also the density so a good packing material will be as effective as possible while needing as little of it as possible and weighing as little as possible because you have to pay per weight when shipping something so those are the considerations for a packaging material and a lot of them are in opposition to each other. So a more aesthetically pleasing packaging option might well be more expensive. A more sustainable option might well be either more expensive or less effective or both. Um, and there are quite a lot of options and it's hard to get a sense of how they compare. So I'm gonna talk you through some of them. now. The way I approach packaging is that you you want to protect the piece from the edges of the box and from other pieces. So nothing can shake, nothing can move around, and you want at least, well, you need an adequate amount of packaging between the edge of the piece and the edge of the box. And what that is depends on the piece, depends on the packaging. I'm going to be packing. Uh, this mug, just to talk you through the mug uh, a little, just because it's kind of cool. It's got the um, the most comfortable handle. I'll link to the video for that and the blog post. But it's a, a, a design for a very comfortable two finger hand, uh, two finger handle, two finger grip on the mug. And then this is sprayed using my atmospheric. Uh, you're not going to be able to see it because it's the camera's too dark. But it's a green. Right, there we go. Green and then going into red and it's hit it from one side so it's picked it up on the end. So the glaze has come in at an angle and caught the piece like that. So this is where the red, it's a tin, uh, chrome tin, chrome base, tin version of the glaze sprayed over the top which turns it from white to red <coughs> when it reacts to the chrome and it's caught that detail in the handle and caught the rim slightly. So it's a kind of combination of a cool diff a few cool things that I was playing with. 
custom order for someone. And then there's a little gift tumbler done in the same way. In fact, this was done in the same uh, spray, so it caught that pattern from the handle. The handles obscured that part, uh, but let, uh, let it hit there. So kind of cool, I'm gonna pack that up. So I do mine with layers, and the way I look at it is you've got a protective wrap layer, then you've got a void fill, then you've got a cardboard box, and then potentially you've got another void fill and another cardboard box if you're double boxing. So the first thing is, what do you wrap these in? Oh, and I should say, um, I said in the, the gift video, but these are thrown so they fit neatly inside. So I can include a little gift in the same style or as a test, a glazed test, um, that will sit inside the mug so it doesn't take any up any extra space. So that's what that is. With regards to wrapping them, you've got a couple of choices. The most obvious is bubble wrap. Everyone knows bubble wrap. It's the most common choice for a lot of things because it is really good. And there are a lot of ways of looking at bubble wrap and how effective it is. And it kind of comes out well on pretty much all of them. So uh, <clears throat> it's relatively cheap. It's very flexible and easy to shape around something. So you could, you know, it's not cut ideally for it, but you can wrap and keep it tightly wrapped around a thing. Um, not, that's not necessarily the case with all options. Um, because these have a little bit of give in them before they pop, they can withstand repeated impacts and they'll absorb them rather than crumpling, they compress. So they keep absorbing over and over again. It's lightweight. Um, it's highly effective for its thickness. You don't need a huge amount of it, so it's not very bulky. Um, it doesn't look great, but it's not the most hideous. They look okay. They look functionally packaged rather than aesthetically packaged. So that's the standard to which everything else is being held. The next best one, as far as I'm concerned, is this Rampack stuff. So um, Rampack is a two-part setup where you have a, um, a tissue layer and this crisscross cut cardboard layer. So it comes flat on a roll and you expand it. You get a bit of equipment that does that. This is the smaller of the two. They've released a new design. I can't remember. I think it's called Wrap and Go. Um, and they have another one which is a bit bulkier. Um, I went with this one because it's just a bit smaller. But um, if you bought one previously, you've probably got the other one, whatever that's called. Um, and then there's this stuff, which is described as cardboard bubble wrap and it's cardboard that's had this shape stamped into it. Now, it's okay. It's um, not that cheap, not very effective, it's not very flexible, but if you build up enough thickness of it, it will protect things in a slightly better way than a sheet of cardboard would, but not vastly dissimilar. So my preference is ran pack wherever possible because it's too uh, separate sheets of paper so you know it's, it goes straight into paper recycling and will be very easily recycled um, and it is effective I don't think it's as effective as bubble wrap in terms of protection for space taken up so you will need a bigger box if you're packing multiple things using this because it needs more distance as far as I'm concerned between pieces you can't pack it as tightly as you can with bubble wrap but for a single piece, this is fine. Um, and I think it's environmentally better. So I use it on my UK orders and I use it on my international orders of a single item. I don't use it, generally speaking, on my international orders of multiple items, because as far as I'm concerned, the carbon cost of having to use a bigger box and more of other packaging, um, bearing in mind it's gonna be flown, uh, for the most part, so it's taking up more space in an aeroplane and the aeroplane can only hold a certain volume. You know, there is a downside to using a bigger box, even if you're not paying for it, uh, as in that you're not being adequately charged, there's a carbon cost to a bigger box. So using a smaller bigger box, a smaller box is probably worth it, even if it use, means using bubble wrap in that regard. I mean, you're weighing off, weighing up more carbon versus single-use plastic. 
bubble wrap can be recycled it's not the easiest thing to re be recycled um, it can be made with recycled plastic but only up to 50% it's the highest I've ever seen you can get oxo degradable ones which are described as biodegradable they're not um, what happens is they break apart into microplastics faster so it's not an improvement but it is a thing so I would just go with your standard highest percentage recycled bubble wrap you can if you're going with bubble wrap um, I wouldn't get the oxo degradable one and I do think there is an argument to be made for it being equally environmentally friendly if the alternative is higher carbon through less efficient transport. But for this, I'm going to use Rampack. So I make these gift tumblers, I've said, and I package them. I want them in a bit of tissue so they can't, um, even if they come into contact with the mug, they're not gonna, it's not gonna be clay on clay, so there's not any chance of them rubbing. card saying thank you for your order it's explaining that this is a gift because um, if I don't include that every now and then someone thinks it was sent in error what I do is get which isn't essential but again just protect the mug Wrap the mug in tissue paper, get some starch packing peanuts. Now, I use starch packing peanuts for everything. I think they're fantastic. They are compressible, but not, they will, they've got some give in them, but they will spring back to a certain extent so they can take repeated impact. They're light, they are biodegradable, they can be dissolved in water, so you can just wash them down the sink. They are compostable. Um, they are actually edible, but they don't taste of anything and they're not made to food standards, so I wouldn't recommend it. But, to check the focus is okay. Yeah. Um, but yeah, they're, they're great. There's no reason to use polystyrene ones. Um, and at this point, I think, it, yeah, the polystyrene ones should just be discontinued because the starch ones are better all round. Other options for void fill, are um, there's a couple of other ones which do have their merits. So basically what I've done there is I've put the starch packing peanuts around the outside and compress it in. It now is cushioned but the mug will be protecting it anyway. There's no force can get to this. As long as that can't move it's fine. The only way that's getting broken is if the mug gets broken first. So that's fine. Your other options A void fill would be something that, like these um, plastic, the thicker plastic ones, or the pockets, the air pockets, or cardboard that's been, um, oh, yeah, I'll just say cardboard, paper, paper that's been crumpled like this. Both of these, I mean, this obviously you could crumple by hand, but this has been machine crumpled. There are machines that expand that, um, and then there are obviously air inflating sealing machines that do that. In both cases, they are an improvement over um, the packing peanuts with regards to one thing. And that is often overlooked, but it's the difference between the density when it's being shipped to you and the density after you use it. So packing peanuts arrive like this. Now that is their density. They arrive at their final density and you have to store them. So you have to buy a sack that frankly is pretty big. I mean, 
does take up a lot of room. Whereas if you were to buy a roll of this stuff, it would come on a flat roll about that big and it would expand to fill a room, but you only expand them as you need them. So these have a really good, they're light and they have low density for their packing when they're in use, but when they're shipped to you, they're much smaller and you expand them as you need them, which is a far more sensible system where possible. That is the other advantage that the RAN pack has, I can't remember if I discussed this or not, but this stuff that expands arrives on a flat roll. Now that means you can store the equivalent of a roll of bubble wrap, which would be that in diameter in something that's that in diameter. Great for you in terms of storage and even better in terms of shipping it to you because shipping bubble wrap, you know, you can fill a lorry with a bubble wrap and it doesn't really weigh anything. Whereas you could get probably 10 times as many um, rolls of the ram pack in or the kind of length. <clears throat> so these are all things that get traded off each other and there's no right answer. You have to pick what works for you. The main thing with the ram pack is that you pull it tight so that you stretch that honeycomb um, structure to it. That is what gives it thickness and it's that that acts as the crumple zone. If you just wrapped it, if you didn't pull it tight, um, you would be wrapping essentially in a flat sheet of paper. So it's that, the 3D structure that gives it its protection. So you have a machine that expands it for you. Um, you can get cardboard ones, they're not very good. Um, the metal machines you lease, so I paid, I think it was about 90 pounds for the machine, but I have to give it back when I'm done. I'm not entirely sure how that system works. And in theory, once I finish with it, it's not mine to keep, and I have to give it back to the people I got it from. So as you can see, it's being pulled tight, and I'm trying to work mostly around the width, but letting it build up at the ends, so you've got cushioning all around. Um, I'm not sure, I've tried a few different ways of wrapping it kind of longitudinally or around the width, letting it expand out and tucking it in or turning it 90 degrees halfway through. I haven't found a particularly good system for it, so I prefer the neatness of just wrapping it like this. And then after you've built up a few layers, I just cut across, keeping it tight. Um, roll that, fold the end. Now some people will wrap it in string once they're done, which is a much nicer uh, way of doing it, or stick a sticker across the end. I found my stickers aren't big enough because you don't get any purchase on this. So I have resorted to the not hugely aesthetically pleasing choice of paper tape and just sticking a bit of paper tape on which is fine, it's not great. Um, for single boxes, for single mugs, I double box, um, generally speaking. I don't always, it will depend on the size and shape of the mug and whether or not I have a box suitable. Um, I just use these thin, quick lock postal boxes. I have stamped my logo on them, just using a relatively inexpensive stamp and ink pad and then made myself a little jig to line up where the center is. Pop the box up, put the mug in. So I just squish some of these in around it. So basically trying to stop it from rattling inside this box. And what the inner box would do, there's two reasons to use an inner box. Um, from a protection point of view, it disperses any impact. So what happens is something hits the outer box 
and the compression will be focused on a single point. But by the time it's dispersed through void fill, hit this wall, compress that wall, it's now spread out over a much larger area. And when it gets transferred to the mug, you're hoping it's no longer a sharp enough impact to actually reach it with any noticeable force. Um, the other thing it does is it allows you to send a nicely presented box and that's not going to take the outer wear and tear of going through a postal system. They're not essential, I don't use them on everything, I use them where appropriate, they add, I think these are about 60p, so they add a cost to the shipping. Um, I prefer the appearance of opening something like this and can and if you wanted to, you can use nicer packaging on the inside. I use the packaging peanuts because I have them, but you can use the zigzag shred multicolored um, paper, or I think multicolored in any color you want paper, which is aesthetically more pleasing. So it allows you to control the unboxing experience a bit more and still have the protection. I have a far more robust and generic outer box, double wall cardboard. You can get triple wall, but that's a bit overkill. A single wall might not be enough. Um, these are cheap. So, what I do, rather than personalize the box, I have personalized packing tape. This is paper uh, with adhesive on. You can get um, ones that you have to wet with water first but as far as i know and i have researched this without being 100 percent certain but it seems that these are absolutely fine to be recycled as they are um, and won't cause any issues so i don't know why you'd want to have one of the the ones where you have to the gummed ones where you have to add water um, if that's wrong please let me know i don't think it is but i'm not 100 percent certain and then you've got a box this box is smaller but not a huge amount smaller so basically I can pack peanuts in around it and this box floats in the middle of that box which will disperse any impact so I put a layer probably an inch thick at the bottom sit that on the center shove a couple of handfuls in and pack around. So I'm just packing in around the outside, making sure to put some down the sides so that it's right in the middle with cushioning around and then I'll fill that up in a second. And then what I personally do is, once that's floating on there, I will put the invoice and a business card that tells people how to dispose of the packaging because some people don't know the best way to get rid of these. Um, they are, as I say, compostable and uh, they're so they can go in your food waste, they can go down the sink and they will just dissolve and so on and so forth. So people might not know that, so that's what my business card is mostly just uh, packaging information, put those on top, another layer, seal them. The final point is fragile stickers. Now some people claim that putting a fragile sticker on means that your package is more likely to be mistreated when it goes through the postal service. <laughs> I don't believe that. Personally I think that while you might get one or two people handling the thing that have a bad day and want to take it out on something, I think that's unlikely. I think it's far more likely the system just doesn't care. So the people who interact with it won't be paid enough and some of them won't even be people, they'll be machines that can't read the sticker um, and they won't be careful with it because they just, yeah, they either don't have the willingness or the capacity to treat it any different. So the goal is to pack something such that a, a fairly typical handling of a parcel won't damage the thing inside. And this way of packaging will survive being thrown as hard as I can at the floor. Um, I'll overlap the video of me doing that as a demonstration, as uh, partly as a meme for Instagram, but you know, they, this is a robust way of packaging and this will survive 
international journeys. I send plenty of these to Australia. So they're, they're being thrown the other side of the world and they're okay. And then the final thing is that my I use a label printer. I've got um, Saldimo 4XL, which is great for prints the big uh, labels, which are infinitely better than the plastic sleeves because they're faster and they are recyclable. So if you're using the plastic sleeves, I would recommend investing in a label printer. It speeds everything up and it's so much more convenient and just better all round. Um, so yeah, finish wrapping tape, stick the labels on, off it goes. Now with regards to couriers, uh, it will really depend what your local options are, um, how many you're sending and what prices you can negotiate and so on and so forth. I use Royal Mail. They hand it over to the local courier, uh, the local, um, the regional mail distributor in that country. So, <clears throat> so it would be uh, USPS in America or Canada Post in Canada and so on. So Royal Mail don't take it the whole way. They just get it to that country and then the domestic mail provider will deliver it the rest of the way. And I don't ha generally have issues using them. Um, that system seems to work perfectly well for me. Uh, I use FedEx for priority and they are fast to America, but the service is not as good. The interface is not as good. Um, there's no aspect of it I like as much as Royal Mail, except the speed where they can pick something up from me and have it in New York delivered by the next morning, which is ludicrously fast. Um, that's pretty much it. The only other thing is that this is for one item. If I were packing two, I'd go for a slightly bigger box. I wouldn't go with the inner box, generally speaking, and I would align them. I'd pick a box where they, you could put two things with space around them. So in, for two mugs, it would be a slightly longer, slightly wider box. I'd put one upside down, handle facing this way, and I'd put the other mug the right way up, handle facing that way, so that you've got two kind of oval shapes that don't touch at any point. Um, but it's just a case of finding what tessellation works for the shapes you've got. Um, and packing two mugs is gonna be different to packing two bowls, it's gonna be different to packing one mug and one bowl. So there's no hard and fast rules. You're just make, trying to make sure that nothing can touch, nothing rattles, everything's packed in nice and tight with a bit of padding between it and the edge. Um, and you've picked the packing materials and the process that makes your life as easy as possible going forwards because you don't want to have to think about it for every single order. Um, this system works fine for me and if you do it like this I would be fairly confident of it surviving all but the worst journey. Um, so I have a breakage rate just tiny like I don't think I had a single breakage in 2011. I've had two this year well, it's definitely under a percent. I don't want to, I know I've taken you know, over a thousand orders, but a lot of those are tools and I'm not really counting them because you can't, if anyone who can break a piece of two mil thick stainless has really kicked that quite hard. So I don't think it's fair to include those, but even just pottery orders, I still have a breakage rate of a fraction of a percent. So I'm fairly confident in this system. I would highly recommend, as I said, the, uh, the starch packing peanuts and either ran pack or bubble wrap, depending on which one you feel works best for you. But all of this is informed by the size and durability of the pieces I make. If you make bigger things or more fragile things, you might want to be more careful. And if you make smaller things and more robust things, you can afford to be less careful, uh, which I am for the tools because you don't need to pack a lump of metal or acrylic in quite the same way you do pots. Um, I think that's everything I was gonna say for this. Hopefully that all makes sense. There's the blog post if you want to read and see pictures of it rather than watching. Hopefully that's useful. Hopefully you can hear me through the croak and let me know your thoughts.